Okay, guys, let's get started. Um, last lecture before the break. How exciting is that? How exciting is that? I'm very excited about that. Uh, and, and not that I'm going to miss you guys, but uh, I think we all deserved a bit of a break, didn't we? And uh, today, uh, one of the last sessions um, before that, we talk about segregation. And segregation, segregation is one of those topics that always pops up when we talk about analytical sociology. And the reason is that people, well, because besides it's a, it's a very it's substantively and, and incredibly important topic, but it's also one of those one of those areas where we look at a macro level pattern. Remember, that's sort of what analytical sociology tries to do, and we think about the micro level mechanisms how it comes about. Right. So last week I talked about remember crime, and I illustrated you this the age crime curve. Well, I was on Tuesday the age crime curve. And as the macro level pattern, and I describe to you how, you know, in this paper that I'm currently writing, how we see that as the result of actions and interactions of individuals, right, when crime is contagious. And then this pattern, this macro level pattern of the relationship between age and crime is the, is the outcome of that. Segregation is sort of a, um, a, a similar macro level outcome that we, that we look at. And it is important to think about it in this way, to think of it as, as a macro level outcome, because, because as you will see, and as we will talk more about after the break, um, segregation at the macro level does not necessarily mean discrimination at the micro level. In fact, you know, I can show you, and I will show you, that when, um, even when people want to live in a completely integrated world, meaning in a, living in a world where everybody around them is diverse, everybody is different, we still end up in a world where people live around similar people. Right? So that's one of those things where the individual motivation do, does not necessarily lead to the macro level outcome that we want to have. And that's also one of those things where I think the value added of sociology really comes into play. Right? So uh, in my opinion, sociology is not just a bunch of, I don't know, dilly-dallying and blabbering around, which is what some people do, but I don't think so. <laughs> I think it's very much about uh, understanding the relationships between the micro-level and the macro-level and understanding that there's sort of something happening here, right? And that then at the macro-level we observe something and that we cannot necessarily draw conclusions about the individuals based on that. Right? That's sort of the whole, the whole idea and that's something that, um, that uh, the other disciplines don't really do. Yeah, they don't really think about these bridges between the micro and the macro level. So that's sort of where segregation comes into play, and segregation is often used as the prime example for where analytical sociology makes sense, where it actually applies, where it really does make a difference. You know, when I was in, in Sweden, you know, I was, uh, I told you I'm in the middle of this analytical sociology thingy, but there are sort of big projects on, first of all, looking at segregation in different countries, different aspects, different spheres, different aspects of social life, but then also trying to understand that through the lens of analytical sociology. But I will talk more about that. So what I want to do today, well, I want to get us started with segregation, and I will talk about you know, segregation in general to begin with. And then for the largest chunk, I will concentrate on what has been called the big sort, I was the reading for this week was from that book by Bill Bishop, so I will talk about that a little bit and uh, and what it means. Uh, but I'm basically just setting the scene for us to understand then segregation dynamics afterwards. And uh, then I talk a little bit about you know you could call it the big move. It's basically one idea about why the big sort happens. You know why do people separate into different directions and how can we think about that happening. And then lastly, I focus a little bit, but not too much, about what it actually means, uh, what are the consequences of that, and, uh, and then if there is some time, I'm going to demonstrate you some first, some first um, uh, examples or where, where I focus on the segregation dynamics, actually. Yeah. But we will come back to that after the break. Okay, 
So what is segregation? I have a definition here. Segregation is the separation of individuals into distinct parts of social life. And you see that this is sort of now a very general definition, right? And actually, we can and, and we do observe segregation in, in many spheres, in many spheres of, of social life and with respect to many, many different attributes. You know, the place where this, uh, where this comes from, you know, when we think about segregation, uh, most of the literature is about um, uh, racial segregation. Racial segregation in the States, you know, if you, I don't know, it's hard to believe, you know, but uh, less than a lifetime ago, there was just tremendous, tremendous segregation in the United States yeah, for the longest time. Uh, with uh, with completely inhumane consequences, you know. I don't know. It's just, just a little little picture that that I found. You know, um, blacks had to sit at different uh, parts of the bus, had to use different entrances, different toilets. If you think about that, it's kind of completely completely crazy. You know, that something like that existed in the United States until not not too long ago. Yeah. So there was the civil rights movement. Uh, you know, in the 1960s, and then later on, you know, fight for fight for equal rights, and uh, and you know, there was a lot of progress, a lot of hard work being made in there. But um, as I will demonstrate you, there's still significant amount of segregation in the United States and elsewhere. Right? Okay, so civil rights movement back in the 1960s, you know, really fought for for equal rights. Uh, uh, across all uh, um, uh, races, ethnic groups, you know, um, parts of the society, and uh, um, residential segregation is often the one where where this became most prevalent. Really, what we mean by the art is a physical, and that's sort of what we what we found: physical separation in neighborhoods where whites and black people used to live, right? I don't know, now you have Hispanics, they are completely Hispanic areas in cities, you know, completely separated out from each other. That's sort of what uh, residential segregation means. And there are many different ways to calculate these kind of things. You know, there are, I don't know, tons of different measures because what is, what is non-segregation, right? Is it when everybody is completely mixed or how do you calculate what is completely mixing anyway, right? Think about, I don't know, that you need to think about the, the composition of groups if you have, I don't know, 80% uh, blue people and 20% red people, you would expect a different random mixing, right? If there would be 50% blue people and 50% red people. So that's sort of one of those um, things that people, I don't know, realize we need to, need to be thinking about, okay, what, how can we actually calculate that? But the story behind that is always sort of the same. You know, you, you, and I have some examples, some visualizations for that about what segregation is. It's really the separation, separation, of uh, individuals into distinct parts of society according to some sort of attribute, right? It could be race, but actually you know, it could be sex as well, it could be age, it could be ethnic uh, origins, uh, nationality, and things like that, right? Okay, so residential segregation actually, you know, that's sort of now a, a, a quote from 1966, uh, there it has proven to be resistant to change of all realms, perhaps because it is critical to racial change in general. Uh, what happened, the big event, you know, uh, the culmination of the civil rights movements, well, there are many, many other changes as well, but like a, like a real, real change, you know, it was, now this is very much US centric today, but, um, but, but it applies to other, to other countries as well. But in the US, it was such a, such a prevalent issue and segregation, is such an important thing in analytical sociology in terms of the micro-level mechanisms that produce it, that uh, we'll focus on that. So in the States, there was, in 1968, the Fair Housing Act. Basically, it was a law that was, that was passed that made it illegal, that made it illegal to discriminate according to uh, race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. Before what happened, people didn't sell houses to, uh, to, to black people in white neighborhoods just what they did, right? There was sort of uh, outspoken uh, discrimination happening there. This act made it illegal. Um, discrimination uh, in terms of, you know, rentals uh, or dwellings and so on. Um, so, but as you see, you know, even, even with these laws in place, we still find segregation. We're still signing for segregation. So there's still, there's still mechanisms that seem to reproduce um, segregation or inequalities 
more more general. And what I want to show you now, you know, now let's 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 move forward, right? So this is sort of the 1960s. Uh, there we are. It's ages ago. Uh, your parents were born those days. And uh, oh, um, now let's fast forward. Let's fast forward to 2015. Yeah? That's a map of New York. That's a map of New York. You see it, and uh, the colors, the dots, different colored dots represent. Um, I think it's 100 people, or 1,000 people, 1,000 people of particular ethnic backgrounds, ethnic backgrounds from the, from the census data. And you look at it. Well, let me click on it to actually go to the website. It's a, it's a pretty cool website. Um, get this started. You can look at other, state, other um, cities in the US as well. So here we are. It's from the New York Times. Oh, come on. Okay, so that's the United States, uh, and that's New York, different census tracts, so that's sort of real data from 2010. And let's look at that. Well, you see Manhattan. Manhattan is uh, here. Manhattan is zooming a little bit. Look at that. That's crazy. That's crazy. That's segregation. That's. Uh, um, these areas, uh, there we are, you know, uh, we can look into to the Bronx, uh, it's uh, predominantly black, uh, Manhattan is predominantly white, uh, up here, there we have predominantly Hispanic areas, right, um, we have predominantly Asian areas of the city, it's crazy, yeah? you would think, oh, there's a bunch of races living in New York, yeah? that's what you would think based from that. You can look at other cities, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not that much better in other cities. There's still, there's still a lot of segregation. Okay, so I invite you to play around with this, you know, check out different parts. If this is where you want to live. Uh, what is the story here? So apparently there are some other things, some other mechanisms that seem to reproduce, that dream to reproduce segregation. Probably even when there are no discriminatory preferences happening there anymore, right? So it, it could be that kind of there are other other factors that sort of play a role in here, and that's sort of the whole point of segregation dynamics. That kind of another or kind of other things that we'll talk about when there are other dimensions that overlap or they evolve historically together, and that these other dimensions can then uh, lead to reproduction of segregation and social inequalities even though you know, there are laws in place, even though there's sort of active um, activism against it, and, uh, uh, and even though individuals at the individual level uh, might not discriminate at all. But we still find the macro-level pattern. And then you kind of see where it's actually, it's actually incredibly important to distinguish the macro-level pattern from the individual, from the individual uh, level behavior. Okay. So we have segregation even today, right? And residential segregation is sort of the, 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 the classic thing that people, people talk about. You know, I just demonstrated that to you, uh, where you kind of see it in the housing market, you know, like uh, where do people, people live? You find segregation in schools. Now that is sort of uh, huge, but even, you know, now I tell you a story, you know, I, I was in Sweden and we had this research project and you think about Sweden, you know, being this very liberal modern country, right? But there is segregation in Sweden. There it is along ethnic categories. And actually there's this thing a few years back, which is great for research because a few years back they changed the legislation in the law in such a way that before people had to send their kids to a specific school in the neighborhood where they lived, Right? But then they kind of uh, um, took that away and parents could, or, or children together with parents, could choose the school they go to. Right? And what you saw, actually what we found, you know, I didn't do it, but colleagues of mine looked at that. They, they, they spotted how, how immediately after that segregation improved, uh, in, in, increased. 
Yeah? There was more segregation happening. In Sweden, it's along, I don't know, Swedish and Westerner people on the one side, non-Westerners, you know, foreigners, I don't know, uh, um, Iraqis, Somalis, uh, people from all other parts of the world. That's sort of the, the, the segregation that happens there. So we, we see it in schools. It means some schools are predominantly of certain ethnic groups, while others are predominantly of, uh, have students of other ethnic groups. Right? We see it in the workplace. In the workplace, it's often segregation along not necessarily race, but often it's segregation along uh, sex. Right? I don't know, if I, if I look around, the people who are professors at the universities, it's mostly male. Mostly, mostly men with, with beard and gray hair. Right? So that's sort of predominantly what you find. Um, you, you see separation into different kinds of work. There's occupational segregation as well. You know, if you look at who are the people who clean up this place, right? who are the people who kind of uh, do certain kinds of work, who are people who, uh, what is their ethnic background, uh, who, I don't know, who teach you know, or, or whatnot. Um, so you find se occupation sector, but even on the top of that workplace segregation, that's sort of what we what we looked at in Sweden as well. Literally, you get the same kind of job, the same kind of job at one company. You know, there are sort of people from from some social category, while in another other another another workplace with exactly the same kind of job, there's people from yet another ethnic category or another social category and so on. So workplaces, so we have these different domains, you know, where sort of segregation happens. Right? It's not just residential segregation, but residential segregation, school segregation, workplace segregation, occupational segregation. You know, the thing that I'm very much interested in is net, what I call network segregation. It's this, uh, this idea or this, this phenomena that we observe that, you know, your friends are incredibly similar to you on all sorts of, all sorts of uh, uh, social, uh, social categories, you know, sex, education, age, uh, even interests, uh, opinions. Yeah. Just look around it and kind of try to think about you know, how, how representative your friends are of the population at large. Right? Think about how many people you know who are, uh, or with how many people you hang out with who are 70 years old. Right? Or think about people you know who, uh, who, uh, I don't, know, who don't go to university, or, uh, you know, and these things just happen. You know? They're sort of not necessarily, um, and that's sort of what, what really interests me in how, how do these patterns, which, is, which are obviously out there, we obviously find them, but how do they come about? Because they do not necessarily mean that there's sort of, uh, there's sort of um, uh, it's, uh, discrimination at the individual level, right? No, I told you in my world, all of my friends have a fucking PhD. That's just how it is. Right. It's not that I have a preference for having, well, I, I don't know, I like to hang out with interesting people, but uh, I don't ask them before, or, and before I think about, okay, could this be a friend of mine? I don't ask them, do you have a fucking PhD? Right. Show me your PhD. Now, that's kind of stupid. I don't know. I'm, I'm not discriminating on that level. But still, most of the people who I know have a fucking PhD, right, who are close to me. So how can that how can that how can that be right? So you actually see the difference already, right? How this actually how non-discriminatory behavior can actually produce macro-level patterns that are highly segregated. And if you would just look at that, and if you would be a policymaker, and if you wouldn't have come to my class, if you wouldn't have I don't know bought into the things I tell you here all term long, you would think that people want to have friends who have PhDs, right? Or you would think that people have certain individual preference for that. But now I'm telling you, no, not necessarily. You know, there's sort of other mechanisms that kind of can produce that. In this case, it's a very simple one. I don't know. I kind of, I just got to know people as you get to know people sitting around you. And we just all happen to go to the same places. It was university. We spend a lot of time there. We spend a lot of time in graduate school, you know, hanging out, talking with each other, helping each other out. And then you become friends. Right? So there you see, there's not necessarily individual level preferences that produce the macro-level patterns that we observe. So we have all these different, all these different domains of segregation. You know, we can think about uh, housing, but we can also think about you know, school, workplace, and, and whatnot, or you would call it number of foci. But you can also look at different sorts of attributes or social categories where, along which segregation occurs. Right? Obviously race, yeah? I don't know, that's sort of the, the classic thing, but also along other ones, along age. As I said, how many people do you know who have similar, who have diff vastly different age than you? In workplaces and in jobs, it's sex segregation. You know, there's a distinction between males and females, ending up in different kinds of jobs. 
having different kinds of opportunities in this world. Ethnic segregation, that's sort of what, what happens uh, and, is, and, is, and is now replacing racial segregation. You know, it's not just blacks and whites anymore. There's sort of Hispanics, there are uh, uh, Asians uh, and, and in different countries, different, different ethnic groups. Uh, are prevalent or uh, play, play a role. So we have all these different attribute dimensions that you can think about as well, right? Like race, sex, age, and whatnot. And when you put these things together, you know, most of the research actually focuses on this little part down there. So people look at one focus, one attribute, but, um, you know, actually I have one, one of those working papers that lies in my computer and I, I, I go back to it at some point when I have some more time. I'm actually exploring how how these dynamics that we will talk about after the break actually play out, you know, when we think about multiple attributes, when we think about multiple foci. And to some degree, the reading for today was about that as well already, because um, there the idea is that some dimensions bring people together, which then also makes them more similar on other dimensions, right? And then you have an overlap of different, uh, different interests and overlap of different social categories and they, 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 amplify, they amplify each other. Okay, so why is it important to talk about segregation? Well, uh, political isolation, linguistic isolation, um, poverty concentration, educational exclusion, all sorts of things you know, that we don't want to have. You know, like I think we want to live in a world where everybody has uh, equal opportunities, where, uh, where uh, and there you see again, so it doesn't suffice, it doesn't suffice to change individual level behaviors and um, and uh, you know it doesn't change it doesn't suffice to make sure that people don't discriminate because we could still end up in this segregated scenario we could still end up in these worlds where inequality is being reproduced right so that's sort of where where we as sociologists come into play and where we need to say and we need to look at how does it actually happen that there are these uh, um, these patterns of segregation still out there. Okay, let me now talk about uh, the big sort. Uh, there was sort of this reading for today, so I will focus mostly on, on, on parts of this book, you know, the big sort, written by Bill Bishop. You know, the guy is, um, is a journalist. He's a journalist. He wrote this you know, it's sort of a popular science book a little bit. You read it, you know, and it kind of... Um, and I think it's important to communicate these things outside of the, of the, uh, of the academic world. Mm. He wrote this book, The Big Sword, Why the Clustering of Like-Minded America is Tearing Us Apart. So the guy is an American, you know, it's a very American-focused, centric, centric book. Uh, but it still has, for us, some very interesting points besides, uh, besides the general, I don't know, the facts that he puts together, but also in terms of the dynamics that he, that he outlines in this book. Yeah? book has also been criticized, especially for the kind of way it presented some evidence. You know, there, there was uh, some people say, and, and, and I agree with it to some degree, that, that the evidence is not the most convincing. You know, and uh, you could, for an academic, I don't know, for a journal publication, probably, I don't know, one would have to be more rigorous about, about things. But nevertheless, it, it has a very interesting, interesting point and a very interesting story that I want to talk about a little bit. So basically, the guy, the guy is this journalist. You know, he lives in Austin, Texas. I don't know if you've ever been in Austin, Texas. Yeah. Have you ever been to Texas? I was in Texas last October, last October for a month. You know. I went there and I braced myself. You know, I thought, here I am, the European, you know, with this German accent, living the international life, entering Texas in the middle of nowhere, you no, know, I, I told to all my friends that I, I bought myself a cowboy hat. I, I, I ate ribs and I pretended to be Republican. And uh, you, know, you need to survive somehow. You, know, you need to survive somehow. And Austin, Austin is sort of this odd man out. So Austin is sort of the cool place. I don't know. I have so many other friends of mine. They, they go to Austin. They, they, I tell them I was in Texas. I said, oh, did you go to Austin? Did you go to Austin? I said, no, I wasn't in Austin. I was in fucking College Station, yeah, Texas A. Yeah. But... Um, but it's still, you know, a university city, so it's a different story than most of the Texas, probably, right? But Austin is sort of this odd man out, which is very, very different. So they're very different kind of people. Um, it's almost, almost the opposite. And, you know, Bill Bishop, he lives in, in this part of Austin where he describes how, at the beginning of the book, very, you know, like a, like a, like a, like a story he tells, 
about how how his neighborhood, how his neighborhood and and the, the community in his neighborhood, you know how they uh, how they have completely different home, completely different views or political values or ideas than uh, than most of Texas, than the rest of it, and and also he describes how during the presidential elections and so on, right, the Democratic candidates I don't know got. 70, 80 percent in their neighborhood, in a way, while in the rest of Texas it was the complete opposite, right? So that's sort of the, the the story that he describes about the experiences that he makes. That although although being in you know a state like Texas, you know, don't mess with Texas. Yeah, that's sort of how it looks like. You know, actually, I went to a rodeo while I was there. You know, I thought that let's give this this whole thing, let's try this whole thing out. You know, I'm 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 all up for the experience. As a sociologist, you can always pretend it's work. So um, I was there, and he describes how, how within a very short, very small environment, kind of very different, you find very, very different kinds of people. And that's basically what he, what his thesis is in, in this book, The Big Sword, where he says, or he kind of puts forward some evidence, you know, that over the last 30 years, um, Americans dramatically clustered in such a way that they live now around people who think and who are like themselves. Right? So that's sort of the thesis he has, and he presents some evidence for that, and I'm going to show you some evidence for that as well. Basically, his idea is maybe people, maybe people became more tolerant in general, but, but now they're all surrounded by people who very much think like themselves. Right? And then we have to start thinking about, okay, what does it, first of all, is it really true? And secondly, um, what does it mean? And then it becomes interesting. Think about what happens when you're surrounded by similar people. Right? People who really think like you. People who have the same ideas. People who have the same interests and so on. Right? Then at some point, you know, you get, you get a very different view of the world. You get a very different, you know, you don't have the conversation. You don't have the dialogue with people who are very different from you. Who have a very different idea about how the world should be. I don't know, or what we, what we should do. So, so this sort of biases our world in a dramatic, dramatic way, right? Uh, in my world, you know, because it's all about education in a way, that's sort of the thing that matters, right? And then, you know, I sort of realized at some point, well, hang on a moment, maybe there are other things in life that matter, and there are many other things in life that matter than writing a stupid paper or getting excited or what the, what the hell, yeah? So what academics do, and sort of uh, that's a thesis that Bill Bishop here has, where he says that these things really separated, really separated out. And he, he exemplifies this in the case of voting. Yeah? And that's where he, where he presents some data for this as well. So the kind of data that he presents is, you know, he looks at this in a long, longer term, you know, like 30, 40 years, right? So his data spans you know, from the 70s to the early 2000s. And there he finds you know, in the States you have Republicans and Democrats, you know, and right now it's sort of very interesting to follow this again, right? Uh, new primaries coming up and let's see where this whole thing goes. It's always fascinating to observe these things from outside, being a European, which kind of, you know, goes there regularly, but kind of is European and who decided to stay in Europe for so many reasons. Um, so the evidence that he shows here is that between 1974 and 2004, the gap in votes for Republicans and Democrats in the U.S. increased in over 2,000 counties. Right? That's sort of these, these small electoral districts. While in contrast, in only 1,000 counties, the gap in votes for the two parties reduced. At the same time, you'll see later on, the overall elections, the overall votes became closer. Right? So they're sort of this thing happening, yes, and it's going back to, to this, to this uh, competitive uh, uh, county. You know, these are all these counties, you know, in, in 1976, this is data from there, from presidential election, Jimmy Carter versus Gerald Ford. And um, you see the, the dark, the black, and the gray areas. These were the ones where, the one, where one candidate had a dramatic win over the other candidate. You know, that sort of the thing. Uh, a landslide vote here defined as winning over the other candidate with more than 20%. Yeah. So some, some areas you could see were more Republicans, other areas were more, were more Democrat. But when we, when we fast forward and we look at that in 2004, there was almost all areas 
or there were some contested states, you know, and that's sort of the thing that fascinates me, you know, how can a whole election, like in the states, always depend on these three, four states, right? I don't know, now Ohio is coming up, uh, uh, Michigan is coming up, uh, and they're sort of the, the, crucial, the crucial places, these are sort of the battlegrounds, while the rest of the country doesn't seem to matter. And people don't even go there, they don't even campaign there because they know, I don't know, Republicans are going to get 80% there anyway, or this is sort of a secure state for the, for the Democrats and things like that. So it's sort of this thing which is fascinating to me, you know, how sort of the fate of a, of a country can depend on a, such a small, small fraction of the, of the population just because they are sort of in the middle. But uh, here, when we compare these two with each other, you know, you see that, that Later on, and there's some more evidence about that, there seem to be more and more states where this difference was more and more pronounced, either in the one or in the other direction. And that's sort of the funny, the interesting thing, because the overall votes, they sort of became more closer together. So if you look at the total number of votes, they, be they became very close. So, you know, the prime example, I probably you don't remember that, but in 2000, 2000, 2000, the presidential elections, you know, first time George Bush, um, he became president. Uh, and, uh, and and Al Gore and Al Gore. Uh, it was one of the closest one of the closest presidential elections ever. You know, actually in terms of the absolute votes, Al Gore got more votes. But still, George Bush, George W. Bush became became president. And when you look at how how these counties actually voted. Then it was this fascinating thing that actually in almost 50% of the communities of these counties, the difference was remarkably large. Right? So there was 20% difference between, between the candidates. So it seemed to be, although they are very close together, overall, overall, it seemed to have been that kind of the counties and the different areas of the states seem to have a very cl clear idea, but they sort of separate it into, into, different, into different camps. Yeah? And that's sort of the thing, you know, we also observe this in terms of um, so many other aspects, you know, uh, not to say that, uh, that, you know, there's no ground in the middle, but uh, when, you, when you just look at the, at the data and kind of what opinions people had now, this is sort of from the, from the last elections, from Obama against, against Romney, uh, you see huge differences, huge differences in terms of you know, on certain issues you know, like uh, labor attitudes, environmentalism, whatever, business attitudes, and so on, between uh, Democrats and Republicans. Now, this is sort of an interesting, an interesting uh, figure, you know, that I took out of the book as well. Basically, what they do here: think about the year two thousand four. You know, this is sort of at the end. This is sort of where we are. And now what they did, they basically looked at the election results, you know, that was, um, um, yeah, 2000, the 2004 presidential elections. And they kind of basically formed these four groups, you know, like these are the counties where, where the Republican won by a landslide, you know, with more than 20% difference. This is sort of the counties where the Democrats won with a landslide with 20% difference. And uh, then in between we had these these other counties, you know, where either the Republican won or where the Democratic candidates won, but not with, with, uh, with more than 20% difference. And then they kind of trace these, trace these uh, results back in time, right, and looked at how did, this, how did these states, you know, that now ended up in, in one of these groups, how did, they, how did they vote over the last 50 years, yeah? And there you see, yeah, you see that there was sort of this divergence happening that states seem to become more extreme, right? In terms of like, I don't know, Texas just becomes more Republican, while, I don't know, Massachusetts becomes more and more, New England becomes more and more, more and more democratic, right? So there's sort of this separation happening here. And, you know, they also demonstrate that, and that's sort of where this overlap with other dimensions comes into play. They also show in this book that this occurs along with segregation and separation along other lines. Yeah. So here, again, they have thought of these four different groups, you know, like uh, Democratic landslide, uh, Republicans landslide on the other side, and sort of uh, the categories in between. And the interesting thing is, well, here they ask, okay, uh, it's about church going, you know, like how many people say they go to church, depending on 
where they where they live in which county you know, uh, is it sort of more mostly a republican or mostly a democratic um, county or area where they live and the thing that you find is not just that these things go up you know that's sort of another story that right? um, people seem to go more to church but the key here really is look at the differences right here sort of they are all sort of the same while here now they seem to diverge right and now in 2000 that's sort of where we are we have now this difference so there's a dramatic difference in terms of religiosity or in the expression of generosity, you know, that's sort of how we often ask it, do you go to church, uh, between Republicans and Democrats. So there seems to be separation happening, not just along, uh, along political lines, but also along other aspects of social life. And that's sort of the point, the point behind this big sword, that kind of this, this big, a big transformation change happening where people sort themselves into communities of like-minded people. And this then amplifies, amplifies opinions, values, attitudes, and so on. Yeah. So that's basically the story here. There's another example here. Let me not talk about that. But the point, the point that sort of the book makes, also drawing another work, you know, here drawing another, some other works, is that Americans are increasingly living in communities and neighborhoods whose residents share their values, and they are increasingly voting for candidates who reflect those values. So on the one side, you know, we're talking about, okay, we want to get rid of segregation, right? We want to live in a world where, where, where I don't know, we, uh, we are integrated, you know, where we are exposed to different, different kind of people. Everybody has the same opportunities. Everybody is valued. At the same time, people seem to sort themselves into highly distinct groups. So there seems to be evidence for increasing segregation when it comes to voting. It becomes more extreme becomes more extreme, not just in the rhetoric of the different parties, but also in terms of for whom do the counties actually vote. Right? They tend to lean more into the one or into the other direction. Overall, there are still as many people voting for the one or the other side, but they kind of tend to cluster in different areas. So people are surrounded by people who think like themselves and who live similar like themselves. So how can this, how can this happen? How does this come about? And now there's sort of this what I call the big move coming into play, which is something that will stay with us for a little, but it's basically here an explanation that, uh, that Bill Bishop is giving us, but um, it's, it's the one that is relevant when we, look at, uh, when we look at segregation dynamics later on as well. So what do we mean by the big move? Well, nowadays, you know, again, as I said, this is a little US-centric, but it applies to other countries in, in the world as well. That Nowadays, we are just much more mobile than we used to be. Right? And when we look at the figures, um, you know, there were figures from the early 2000s, 4 to 5% of the population in the United States move every year from one county to another. That's a large chunk of people. 4 or 5% of the total population every year. That's a lot of people. Well, actually, that's four times as many people as uh, who enter the, or who either get born or who kind of migrate into states and so on. So basically who enter the population. So there's a huge chunk of people moving around. And, you know, we think that moving kind of gives us, should bring us all more together. You know, we are sort of uh, go out in the world and so on. But the fascinating thing here is that increasing moves or increasing mobility actually does not lessen segregation, but it increases it. It increases it. So... There's a lot of people moving every year, and the reason for that is that people don't move around randomly. Now, this is sort of what we call a random walk. Let's say a person would just move into a random, random neighborhood. But people, people think about where they want to live. Yeah? People think about where they want to live. You think about where you want to live. Uh, when you think about um, where in Dublin you want to live, well, you think about, okay, what can I afford? But then you also um, look at, okay, is there sort of the, that's at least how I thought, you know, when I kind of looked for where I'm going to live in Dublin, I looked at, are there some, some nice coffee places nearby, sort of a neighborhood that kind of speaks to me, Do I, am I comfortable there, you know, are there certain amenities, what are the rents, you know, in the States it's often about the church, actually, you know, it doesn't matter to me at all, but, you know, for some people it does matter. So, when people move, there are sort of these little things that matter, right? We have sort of preferences. We have sort of certain, some, some ideas, right? When, you know, I wouldn't want to live in a city or in a part of town where, where I'm depending on a car, for example, right? 
I'm just used to walk around, I'm just used to, to have things close by and so on. While other people who grew up, I don't know, who come from somewhere in Texas, you know, because that's just what you do, you sit in the car to get to the coffee shop in Hawaii, there's sort of different things that matter. And not to say that the one is better than the other or anything, but they are just different, different values that people have. And so that's basically this idea here. You know, you now have a little, little toy example. You know, we have two different neighborhoods with reds and blues. You know, there are as many reds and blues, and everybody lives in a neighborhood with 50% similar and 50% dissimilar, dissimilar others. Now, when when moves happen in a non-random way, but in such a way that people go to places and kind of are in line with what they what they want to have or with the kind of the people that live there and so on. Uh, here we go. You see, I didn't change the composition of people. There are still 10 reds, 10, 10, 10, uh, 10, 10 red individuals and 10 blue individuals, but now everybody lives in a highly segregated environment. Now everybody lives in a neighborhood with 100% similar and dissimilar others. And that's basically the idea here that, um, uh, that they present some data for, the kind of people who moved from Republican counties were, were very likely to settle in other Republican counties while people who left counties with a high proportion of evangelicals, for example, largely moved to other counties uh, of like faith and things like that. Of course, we need to be careful. Remember, ecological fallacy, assignment, bang, here you are. You know, we cannot draw conclusions about individuals here, just from data that kind of there are some people moving from Republican counties uh, and, and they, the, the people move into, into other Republican uh, counties. We cannot really say without the data, the information about the individuals that these are actually Republicans, right? Could still be Democrats. Um, so, but, but nevertheless, you know, panels of migration are linked to culture, faith, and politics. And that's sort of the point that, um, that Bishop is making in, in his book. And, and then he, he follows from that, that, that now, or uh, that followed from that, where the people were clustering communities of like-mindedness, and not just geographically, churches grew more politically homogeneous during this time, and so did civic clubs, volunteer organizations, and dramatically political parties. People weren't just moving, the whole society was changing. And that's sort of this idea of the, of the big sort that is being put forward. And then, you know, this creates little bubbles. This creates these little pockets of like-mindedness around you, you know, and I don't know, in, in the States you can really see that, I don't know, you know. I was also traveling in New Mexico for a while, and then you go to some Santa Fe, it's a completely different environment you know, from the rest of New Mexico, or you go to certain communities in California, uh, you know, California predominantly Republican, but then some other areas just completely the opposite, right? So it's this idea of segregation, the idea that this occurs along many different, many different lines. So I have a little video from, you know, on Tuesdays we are in the, after all, we are in the Clinton Auditorium, so I thought let's have, let's have the, bring in the good man, bring in the good man. So this is actually Bill Clinton, you know, former president of the United States. Uh, he talks a little bit about this big sword and he, he makes some points that could help us here. So let's see if this works. I wrote a book, you know, I recommend to people all the time, called The Big Sort, S-O-R-T, by Bill Bishop, who is a journalist, and as it happens, a pretty progressive Democrat from Austin, Texas. And what provoked him to write this book was, his neighborhood in Austin lost its only, his only Republican neighbor. And he loved this guy. And he talked about how their kids played together and they took walks together and how much he learned from their arguments because they didn't see everything the same way and how much it meant to him to know there was somebody that he liked and respected and cared for that he could actually have an honest discussion where neither one of them would be completely predictable. But he said, I was the only one of our neighbors who was nice to him. Now, in their neighborhood, in the 2004 presidential election, Senator Kerry defeated President Bush 3-1. to one. So the Republican guy moves out, and he moves into another neighborhood in Austin, Texas, where President Bush defeated Senator Kerry 4-1. to one. And Bishop has said, you know, both our neighborhoods were poor for that. He pointed out that in 1976, when Jimmy Carter and Gerald Ford had a razor-thin election, by the way, which ultimately culminated in a lifetime friendship between the two of them until President Ford passed away. 
But anyway, in that election, a one percent election, only 20% of America's counties voted for one or the other of them by 20% or more. Which meant that in 1976, you could go into any coffee shop or, or hair salon or barber shop and, or bowling alley and have a conversation with people who didn't necessarily disagree with you about what was going on in America. By 2004, when President Bush won the closest re-election margin of any re-elected president since Woodrow Wilson in 1916, 48% of our counties voted for one or the other of them by more than 20%. That much movement. So he said, you know, America's making real progress. This Bishop guy's chart, he was like, he said, we're not as racist as we used to be. We're not as sexist as we used to be. We're not as homophobic as we used to be. The only bigotry we have left is we just don't want to be around anybody who disagrees with us. <laughs> okay, so um, there is this overlap along different dimensions. You know, they kind of seem to seem to play a role in here then. Because then if people separate along certain categories, right, and, and people also happen to have other attributes, and we'll come back to that later on, you know, we find this separation into different camps, into different groups that seem to be uh, very pronounced and it's sort of a, a, a sometimes puzzling where they actually come from. So I have this other example here that I found fascinating, and it's just look at that. It sort of was, I think, an election spot at some point, but it brings home one point that I want to make. What do you think of our DC plans to raise taxes on families by $1,900 a year? What do I think? Well, I think our Dean should take his tax hiking, government expanding, latte drinking, sushi eating, Volvo driving, New York Times reading. Lobby conspiracy, Hollywood loving left wing freak show back to Vermont, where it belongs. Okay, so um, the point here being, we'll come back to that later on, you see, um, and there's an, actually a series paper, we, we have another session about that, why do liberals drink Latin? Yeah, that's sort of a question that we can actually see, we see these correlations across different dimensions, where you wonder why, sh why should Democrats drink more Latin than Republicans? It doesn't make sense, yeah, but it's something that we actually do observe. Uh, things that kind of uh, re-amplify each other. So um, basically the big sort uh, to, to summarize that, you know, was this observation that uh, unprecedented opportunities for mobility did not lessen segregation but increased them, at least in the political domain. Uh, over the last 30 years, Americans dramatically clustered in such a way that they live now around people who think and are like themselves. You know, these things are relevant for us because, you know, we, we live in a much more mobile, globalized world and we can find similar patterns, similar patterns in, uh, in other countries in the world as well. So let me briefly talk about what does that imply. Yeah? And the point that Bishop makes in his book is that when you are surrounded by people who are like you, well, this is basically an echo chamber, right? You kind of, you, you, you hear the same kind of things back, right? There's nobody voicing another opinion anymore. Right? So there are a kind of people, and, and then the point, and that's kind of something that we do observe, that certain opinions and values get amplified because of that. Just think about the people you are you are friends with. You know, there's sort of an opinion coming up, and you're all the same opinion. You kind of you you not necessarily, but there's sort of often cases where one then moves into this direction, right, and becomes more more extreme in a certain attitude of value. Right? So here, the idea was that uh, as people heard their beliefs reflected and amplified, they would become more extreme in their thinking. What had happened over three decades wasn't a simple increase in political partisanship, but a more fundamental kind of a self-perpetuating, self-reinforcing social division. And you see how now we are very much at the back of what this, at the core of what this lecture here is all about, that now we are having some action effects and some feedback loops, right? And how then one thing, one thing leads to the other. And after the break, we go more into this, you know, and also you know, looking at some Fascinating statistics, actually, you know, this is sort of back now from the 40s to the 1960s and so on, where you actually see the observed residential segregation 
and the percentage of people who approve segregation. So there's a kind of a huge disbalance. Well, it's sort of still a huge number. It was still in the 1960s. So there's still sort of 50% approving segregation. But that sort of gets to this point that I want to make that um, individuals might not necessarily might not necessarily have a preference for segregation, but we can still end up in segregation as a, as a macro-level pattern. And there are some other examples that we come back to, but let's do that after the break. But maybe if you observe it, I don't know, when you go to a party, and uh, just to outline this briefly, when you go to a party, you know, and there are guys and girls standing separately from each other, right? And a simple rule, a simple rule that you don't want to be you know, surrounded in a group with, uh, with more than 85% people from the opposite sex, right? You're still very, I don't know, you're happy to talk with some guys about some, some, some stuff, or guys are very happy to talk with some girls about some stuff. You want to have at least some people, at least some people from the same sex around you in, in the group that you, are, that you are talking with and that, you're, that you are hanging out with. 50% suffices to separate the whole thing out. At the end, if you play out the dynamics, it's completely separated groups, guys stand together, girls stand together, just as a dynamic of that. But we will talk more about that after the break. So for the break, you know, I wish you all a great break. Uh, what I can recommend you to do, well, there's one reading which goes into these dynamics of uh, residential segregation by Thomas Schelling, right, sort of the guy who won the Nobel Prize. Fascinating guy. You know, this is the kind of guy I felt bad about coughing next to because I thought he might die. Uh, anyway, um, so that's the reading. But the book, Micromotives and Macro Behavior, is a fascinating read. And it's very easy to read, actually. You know, it's not complicated. It's just really a book that you kind of you get fascinated by, and, and it's a very inspiring, and it still inspires me very much. So have a nice break. Enjoy the time, and see you back at the end of the month.